April 19, 1982. Arctic winds cancel early hints of spring. More than nine inches of snow covered Minnesota today, and an incoming blast of Arctic air blew away thoughts of spring in the northern plains. Parts of New England braced for more than three foot floodwaters that chased Vermont residents from their homes. Heavy rains drenched the eastern seaboard early Sunday, dumping more than an inch of water on some areas that combined with snowmelt to touch off flooding through the northern Appalachian Mountains. But by afternoon, storms moved off into the Atlantic Ocean, pushed by winds clocked at up to 45, mile, 45 miles per hour in Boston and Portland, Maine, leaving behind sunny skies and mild temperatures. However, flood warnings continued today for portions of the Black River in western New York and for some rivers in New Hampshire due to rapid snowmelt. A small but heavy band of snow fell across northern Minnesota early, early today dropping nine and a half inches of snow at Silver Bay and eight inches at Two Harbors. The heaviest amounts were reported along the northern shore of Lake Superior. A stockman's advisory for a mixture of rain, snow, and cold winds was issued for most of North Dakota today. An Arctic air mass was expected to sweep into the north central states, bringing a return of winter conditions. Up to three feet of water submerged some roads in northern and central Vermont Sunday making travel by boat almost more feasible than car than by car. State highway crews patched, washed out roads today and assessed the cost of damage caused by four flooding rivers fed by melting snow and a heavy rainfall. There's just a lot of flooding here, said St. Albans-based state police dispatcher Deborah Duffy. There are quite a few evacuations. The specific number of people evacuated was unavailable, but Miss Duffy said they were mostly residents along Route 105. It's not really a tragic thing. No water pouring into the houses, she said. Weather officials said the worst flooding was reported along the Lamoille River near Jeffersonville and Waterville, and water was spilling five and a half feet above Fairfax Dam. Heavy rainfall and melting snow triggered flooding along rivers and streams in the Adirondack region of upstate New York. Some families left their homes and some secondary roads were underwater, but no organized evacuations were ordered. School calls meeting to study bids on loans. The South Vermilion Community School Corporation Board will consider two bids for loans during a special meeting at 8.30 p.m. Tuesday at the administrative office offices, 153 South 8th Street. The board received two bids last week from Clinton State Bank, which offered up to $100,000 at 9% interest, and Citizen State Bank, which bid up to 1,141 to 500 at 8.75% interest. If expected, if accepted, the short-term loan will supplement tax funds delayed by litigation. The school system will borrow the money as needed, then repay the loan by December 31st from tax money. Other items on the agenda include personnel, information on costs of bidding insurance, and a discussion of the basketball program. A closed executive session on personnel at 7.30 Tuesday will precede the public meeting. April 21st, 1976, Phil Hayes' Secret Weapon in Senate Campaign, Nancy, by Kay Hines. Senatorial candidate Philip Hayes, the David attempting to topple established Democrat Senator Vance Hark, has, has a surprise weapon in his campaign. Its name is Nancy. Nancy is Hayes' other half, while Hayes stumps larger cities and northern sections of the state Nancy combs southern Indiana communities, telling voters and vote makers the reasons why they should vote for Hayes. Clinton was on the Hayes route this week while Congressman Hayes visited Terre Haute. Mrs. Hayes visited the Clintonian office. Dark haired, big eyed, and petite, she was casually attired in blue jeans and a sweater, ready to take on the press in a long, hard day of campaigning. Assessing the pro Hayes mood in southern Indiana, 
Mrs. Hayes said support for her husband is growing. Campaigning and response are progressing at an excellent rate, she said. People seem to be very responsive. They're curious to know something about my husband. Who is the young fellow taking on three terms Senator Hark in the Democrat primary? Hayes defeated Roger Zion two years ago, capping up a political career which then included a term in the state senate and presidency of young democrats of vanderbilt county he attended indiana university's bloomington campus there he and nancy met and married after their freshman year he was president of the freshman class he attended knight law school in indianapolis was a precinct committeeman and a deputy prosecutor in evansville his hometown time could be crucial in the hayes campaign should the election effort have started a year ago. We don't know if that's time detrimental. I believe if my husband were to lose to Senator Hark, it would be by a very narrow margin. I feel my husband is going to win. Polls taken by a New York firm almost three weeks ago assessed Hayes' name recognition at 18% and Hark's at 98%. People planning to vote for Hayes tested at 28%, 10% more than they were aware of his record. Persons voting for Hark, according to the survey, were 41%, with a 30% undecided. Phil Who vote. Hayes has set a $100 limit on campaign contributions, a factor which his wife says is a first nationwide. The limitation is regarded by Hayes as the best way to eradicate special interests. Issues are left, up, left, issues are left to Representative Hayes, rather than touting an anti-heart message. Mrs. Hayes prefers to campaign pro Hayes. Until the campaign and the 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. schedules end, Mrs. Hayes is headquartering in the Hayes Ev Evansville home, mentally tallying votes. April 21st, 1930. Vermilion Man is awarded suit. William H. Bonner awarded decision in suit filed over auto accident. Special to the Clintonian. Rockville, Indiana, April 21st. A Park County Circuit jury late Saturday afternoon awarded William H. Bonner of Vermilion County a decision in a $3,000 damage suit, followed by Mrs. Thelma Warner. The plaintiff was asking damages from injuries which she claimed were received in an auto accident over a year ago. The case went to the jury at 3.20 and an hour later the verdict was reached in favor of the defendant. Mrs. Warner alleged in her complaint that she was injured while sitting in a car in front of Ransom Phillips' home on State Road No. 41. She claimed the automobile driven by Bonner struck her the car in which she was sitting, inflicting injuries from which she says she has never recovered. The defendant, represented, represented by Bert Conley of Newport and J. M. Jones of Rockville, based their case on the fact that Warner's car, that the Warner car, was parked in the highway and not at the side as the plaintiff contended. The trial took four days of last week's court session and was featured by the fact that six attorneys were involved in the case. George Wells and Ira Kissner of Terre Haute and McFadden and McFadden local lawyers were members of the plaintiff's staff. To hold examinations for naturalization. A government examiner from Cincinnati is to be at Hillcrest Community Center tomorrow night at eight o'clock to conduct examinations for applicants for citizenship papers, it was announced today by L. O. Brown, superintendent. The examinations are to be oral, and Mr. Brown stated that visitors who are interested will be welcome. April 21st, 1913. Engine topples. Engine number 827, in charge of engineer Frank T. Keel and brakeman Robert Smith, toppled over in a ditch at the south edge of Clinton, above Deering Mine No. 1 at 1255 today, after hitting a piece of bad rail at a curve. The fireman jumped while the engineer stuck with the engine after climbing out on the ten tender until he saw it was going to go, then he jumped. 
Smith was taken to Clinton Hotel, somewhat bruised, while Mr. Kell had a shoe torn up and the foot somewhat injured, though neither is much hurt. A Clintonian man who went to the scene of the accident and telephoned the facts in found the track considerably torn up and the engine laying about 150 yards from where the bad rail at the curb first set the tender to wobbling. The engine was running backwards with the tender in front and about 15 cars following. The engine and tender went off after wobbling along the tracks about 100 yards and had plowed about 50 yards after they left the rails entirely. Another engine had come down from the Jackson Yards and taken, away the car and taken the cars away, but no crew had come to repair the tracks at 2 p.m. It looked as though it would take several hours to make the point passable by miners, trains, and coal cars that come from the south mines each afternoon. The ties, rail, and road bed were all somewhat torn, twisted, and mussed up. City's oldest store celebrates 42nd year. F.L. Swinehart is celebrating the 42nd anniversary of establishing of the business he owns and controls by sale, which began today. Swinehart's is the oldest continuous established business in the city, and the growth of the store reflects the growth of the city. Since 1871, R.H. Swinehart, father of the present owner formerly had a one-story structure there with a tin shop in connection. Later, the boys, Harry P., now of Denver, and F.L. of Clinton were taken into the store. Harry Swinehart was 23 and Frank 21 at the time. The older brother went into the tin shop while the younger worked in the unreadable and the buying department unreadable blacking stoves unreadable part of his duties frank l swinehart became sole owner about 10 years ago and he later built the second story back to the alley so the home of the store was two complete stories the depth of the whole lot 158 feet the front was improved about five years ago and the last year the big annex, which extends on into the lot territory that fronts on 3rd Street, was built and connected across the alley with the main building. This is the only store in the city having a room more than a half block in depth. One seldom, if ever, finds Mr. Swinehart off the job, and it is his energy and his constant attention to the demands of his business and the needs of his customers that has enabled this expansion to go on. It seems entirely appropriate that the 42nd anniversary of one of the city's leading stores should be appropriately celebrated.